Hello to everyone, uh, this is Dan Keating, and I am giving uh, one of the presentations in the series called Crushing the Serpent's Head. That's a very vivid name, uh, but a fitting one for looking at Christ's work in this season, uh, the Lenten season, looking toward his passion, death, and resurrection. Uh, I've been asked to speak into the uh, topic of spiritual warfare and specifically looking at Christ's temptations in the desert. So this will be my topic. In a sense, the, uh, the topic of spiritual warfare is the, is the point. It's, it's the topic we're looking at. But the particular texts we're going to be studying uh, have to do with Christ's own temptation uh, by the devil in the wilderness and what those mean for us and how we can triumph in him. So where is the story of Jesus' temptation to be found? And here I've given you, uh, along with the talk, you've got a one-page handout that has the three accounts of these temptations. Uh, I've put colored, uh, I've colored them so you can see the, the writing a bit more easily. The words that the devil speaks are in blue and the words that Jesus speaks are in red. Um, I'm not saying anything about the colors by that, uh, that connection. But red letter editions, often the Lord's words are spoken in red. So I've put that there so you can more easily see this dialogue. In a sense, the first account comes in Mark, Mark 1, 12 to 13. It just says, The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. What you have in this in the sentence is a highly condensed view of it. But all the key elements are here. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. We'll see that this is a, a consistent point and I think really interesting. In the wilderness, 40 days tempted by Satan. What Matthew and Luke are going to do is they're going to fill out those temptations and give us the, uh, the details, the dialogue in those temptations much more fully. Mark tells us he was with the wild beasts and that the angels came and ministered to him. Okay, well, what I want to do is is now look at the longer accounts, specifically in Matthew first, but then we'll compare some things with Luke. But before I do that, I, I, I want to identify one really significant feature of this. <clears throat> in each gospel, the scene of Christ's temptation presents the first appearance of the devil in those gospels, and, and very certainly the first time that he speaks. So, you know, in a sense, this is the inauguration of the spiritual warfare. Whether it's in Mark or Matthew or in Luke, this is the first time the devil appears on the scene. And the first time he speaks and seeks to deflect Jesus from his divine ministry. Uh, we'll see that this will connect back to Genesis 3, which you've already looked at, and how, in a sense, this is where in a very real way, what was prophesied in Genesis 3 now finds its first location. Here's where the battle is joined. It's also the case that this is Jesus' first victory over the devil. Undoubtedly, you know, he'd been around 30 years. He's probably done some kind of basic spiritual warfare. But this is the time when the battle lines are drawn, the devil comes in, Jesus rebuffs him, and achieves his initial victory. Not the final one, but the initial victory. So let's look at the temptation of Jesus according to Matthew. This is chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. The first thing that it says is, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I just look at Luke. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit for 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Uh, it was the Spirit's purpose to take him there. After this, this baptism, his inauguration, you might say, his anointing for ministry, he doesn't immediately go and begin preaching and healing and so on. He goes into the wilderness as Israel went into the wilderness. And there he's tempted by the devil. I think it's not difficult to see that the Spirit in a sense, leads him into a place where he knows he will be tested or tempted by the devil. 
I think we know that this word test or tempt is the same word. We have two English words. We have the word temp tempt or temptation and test or testing. In Greek, these are one word. They mean it's a word full of meaning and you have to see what the full sense is. But he was in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil from the devil's point of view, tested in, in a sense for his messianic mission by his father to prove himself to be what he needs to be, to do that battle and to win the victory over the devil. So the spirit leads him. I think this is a really crucial point. Think back to Israel in the desert. What happened? Um, how were they led? They were led by a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Um, the first by night, the second by day. And it was, it, it's, it's often been seen that the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud is itself the presence of the Holy Spirit and a type of the Holy Spirit that will now lead Jesus and now leads us in carrying out what we're supposed to do. So the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness there to be tempted or tested by the devil. Forty days, forty nights, and he fasts. It's a long fast. I've never done a 40-day fast. Other, others can do that. Uh, they have done that, but it's a long fast. And the fasting does two things at the same time. It prepares him spiritually to be freed from other concerns and things, to be ready for battle. It's like a preparation for battle. It also makes Jesus vulnerable. Physically and otherwise, he's vulnerable in, in his fast. He's in great need. He's weakened and in a sense, he's strengthened and weakened at the same time, but in different respects. Fasting weakens us in one sense and makes us more vulnerable, strengthens us in another sense, and fits us for battle. And Jesus' own preparation prepares the way for us in these things. I'd like to recall here a passage from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, one of my favorites. It goes like this. Paul says that no temptation, you could also translate that testing, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted or tested beyond your strength. But with the temptation or testing will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is a tremendous promise of those of us, for those of us who are in Christ and know the power of God. Notice it doesn't say God will spare you from every temptation or testing, but rather he will only allow that which he gives you the strength to endure. And the Lord is going to be our, our, our great exemplar for that, the one who led the way. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested, but he was not tested beyond his strength. Rather, he, by, the, by the power of the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit who led him, he's enabled in our place as the new and second Adam to endure the test and be faithful to it. A word on these three temptations. We could spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just say a word about each. In Matthew and Luke, we see three times the devil comes to him. In the first, if you are the Son of God, notice all of them are preceded by that, if you are the Son of God. It reminds you of this, you know, testing of Adam or of Eve specifically in, in, the, in the garden. You know, did God say to you, you know, are you, it's, it's a questioning of identity. If you are the Son of God, do these things. And so the temptation also comes with a, a questioning of who Jesus is. Is he really the Son of God? Who is he as the Son of God? And the devil's trying to take a half-truth and drive it and deflect him from his true ministry. The first temptation is turn these stones into bread. This seems to be appealing to basic hunger and to use his power to provide for himself instead of waiting for his father to provide. Here he is, 40 days in. It's like, you're hungry. You're really hungry. You need food. You've got power for you, the Son of God. Just turn these stones into bread. Let's see your power. Let's display this. You can do this. What does Jesus do? He responds by speaking the word of God back to him. <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His confidence is in the word of God. He's not looking to provide for himself by the power that he has. He's going to wait for his father to provide for him. The second temptation in Matthew takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and says, cast yourself down. Um, and it says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will give his angels charge of you and they will bear you up on their hands. 
in a sense, he's saying, if this is really true of you, if you're the son of God, if God is going to provide for you, let's see it, let's display it, let's see it done all in one go. <clears throat> the temptation here seems to be to use his power for a visible and impressive display of sheer power, wowing the people, and in one go, in a sense, winning the people to his side. Jesus resists the temptation of a showy display. He says, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Rather, again, waiting for God to work out the kingship of the Lord, his power in his own way, not showing it off and trying to win the people by this kind of display of the kingdom of God. How much are we often tempted to want to use the power of God that we might even have for some kind of showy display of who we really are and, and, and showing it off rather than waiting for the time and the place for the power of God to really be at work to show the kingdom of God in the way that God wants. Finally, all the kingdoms will be his if he will bow down and worship the devil. The temptation here seems to be to think in terms of political power and rule, to take on that role of king like an earthly emperor, to displace the great emperor in Rome, the Caesar, and to become the king of the world, um, in a sense, outdoing Caesar at his own game. And this he will have if he will only bow down and give reverence to Satan. He will have all the kingdoms of the world. Well, it's probably an empty promise anyway, but the temptation is to give himself over to another power in order to have that kind of power in hand. How much this temptation is still there to gain by other means, by other spirits, by other powers, the kind of power we want to reign and rule in the world. And Jesus is having not, none of it. He will honor and worship the Lord God alone. And this is his response. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you, you shall serve. And he then rebukes the devil and sends him away at this point. In a sense, almost in the temptations, the devil is now revealed for who he really is. The source of these words and these temptations are now fully revealed and Jesus rebukes the devil directly and resists him with the word of scripture. Interestingly, Jesus rebuffs the devil on all three occasions with a timely citation of the scripture. You get the impression all the scriptures that he quotes are from Deuteronomy. You get the impression Jesus had been reading Deuteronomy lately. He certainly marshals the text from Deuteronomy to resist the devil in this case. What happens then, having failed to lead Jesus into disobedience and unfaithfulness, the devil leaves and the angels of God come and they minister to him. Presumably, at least spiritual consolation, but who knows? Like Elijah in the wilderness, they may have provided for him bread in the wilderness and a kind of physical refreshment. We don't know. In any case, the one, the one angel leaves and the other angels come, the angels of God, and provide for Jesus. He's resisted the temptations, waiting for his father to provide, and that's just what happens with the angels of God who come to minister to him. The account in Luke is much the same. It's the spirit that leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. Luke records the very same three temptations, the same scripture passages. He reverses the second and the third temptation. Um, that's not probably terribly significant, uh, but the same temptations are there. And in Luke, it ends by saying, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Luke makes clear that this is the first installment of the fight. He's going to come back again. The devil probably comes back at many times in Jesus' ministry, but one decisive time he comes back, and that's in the Garden of Gethsemane, when battle will be joined again, and the Lord will, in a final way, drink the cup that the Father has for him in the way the Father has, not according to the devil's tactics. Now, what I'd like to do, before concluding and wrapping up, I'd like to just connect this temptation in the desert with a passage from 1 John. This is 1 John 2.16. And John's speaking there about not loving the world. Don't love the world. And he says, for all that is in the world, and then a kind of parenthesis, what's that? Or a dash. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life 
is not of the Father, but is of the world. Curious three things here. Why does John put it this way? It's so I'm like, well, he says these three things, the, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life, or the boast of life. What's going on here? Well, many, many think that this threefold temptation has reference both to the temptation of Eve in the garden and of the Lord Jesus in the wilderness. And it's a summary way of, of speaking about them. Um, in the garden, just to look at that briefly, after being tempted and lied to by the serpent, Eve looks on the fruit and it says three things about it. She sees that it is good for food. Reminds one of that opening temptation to turn stones into bread. It was pleasing to the eyes. Notice John says in the second, the, the desire of the eyes. And that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. This um, desire for wisdom in, in the, the, that temptation in the garden was linked with having your eyes opened and being like God. And so there is this sort of displacing God. This desire for wisdom is, is a desire to be gods on our own. And this seems to be that crowning temptation. I'll give you all this if you'll just worship me. <laughs> um, there's a way that Satan's displacing the role of God by drawing attention to himself with the temptation that they will, they will have the wisdom to be like gods themselves. A different kind of wisdom, a different way of coming into that sonship that was there for Adam and Eve. So Jesus in the wilderness, there's probably a link here between what happens in the garden and these three temptations and one John. So what I'm trying to say is, though it's not perfectly clear, the three things we see in the garden, the three temptations of Christ, and the three things here in one John are probably all linked and illuminate one another. What happened in the garden? The first Adam... Adam and Eve, the first Adam, succumbed to the temptations in the garden, disobeyed God, and was exiled from the garden into, you might say, a wilderness where things didn't grow nearly as well. What do we see in Jesus' temptation? The second Adam, who is the Son of God, goes into the wilderness. There he's tested by the devil. He conquers those temptations. He proves obedient, and in the end, his obedience will lead us from the wilderness back to the garden. A reversal of fortunes between this, the first and the second Adam. I think, again, connecting with our Genesis 3 passage, that here we see the seed of the woman conquering the, 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 the serpent's seed. And what happened with the exile is now reversed. Disobedience leading us out, obedience and faithfulness, conquering in spiritual warfare, leading us back into the garden. I've given you a couple of readings. Uh, the first one is actually from St. Augustine's commentary on this passage in 1 John. And he, there he's making the connection between the passage in 1 John and the garden and Christ's temptations. Uh, so I, I offer you this reading in Augustine to show these links and how they were put together. Our task, according to John here, is to follow in the footsteps of Christ, the second Adam, not the footsteps of that first Adam. By rejecting the allurements, these, these false desires, and so doing the will of God and loving the Father. Okay, a few things to conclude. As Christ was led by the Spirit to a place of testing, so are we, in our own way. Christ decisively defeated the devil. Yes, he certainly did on our behalf. But by that decisive victory, it's not simply a substitute for our own, but by being joined to Christ and sharing in his work, we also share in his testing, in his temptation, you might say. As the members of his body, we do battle with the devil. It's very clear throughout the whole of the, uh, of the New Testament. We're not spared from that battle but we're given the weapons by which to fight that spiritual warfare and to stand as Christ did. Another way to say this is, by virtue of what Christ did, it's, we're certainly freed from the devil's clutches, 
but we're not quarantined away in a safe place. By aligning ourselves with Christ, we're actually signing up for the battle. We too, as his body, as the members of his body, are being, in a sense, led by the Spirit into the wilderness of God's choosing for us, that we too might be tested and might, be, might conquer in him. We might be victorious in Christ. We too are led, particularly in this season, through prayer and fasting, in a sense to make ourselves vulnerable, but in another sense to make ourselves strong. So that, that Christ might conquer in us and that through us he might conquer for others. By, by God's word and by his spirit, notice, the spirit led him out in the wilderness and it was the word of God that strengthened his resolve and that armed him for battle. By his word and spirit, the spirit leading us to make use of that word, we too can resist as Christ did. And we, we triumph and conquer. That's not a pointless resisting. It's following in the steps of the Lord. Or I would like to say it even more accurately or better, by the Spirit in us and by Christ's word in us, we resist in him. Um, he lives in us. Christ himself resists the devil in us. He's the one fighting for us. Uh, there's a, a line from a, a, a Paul Beckman song that we like to sing, um, recounting this that says, where Adam failed to stand, Jesus is the victor. Very, very true. It's, it's true of these temptations. Where Adam failed to stand, Jesus is the victor. And I would add, in terms of our participation in this, where Jesus was the victor, so we too stand and conquer in him. Um, we're also meant to be uh, conquering in the Lamb. So as we consider these passages, um, may the Lord give us grace in this season to overcome and conquer by the presence of the Spirit and through God's word. Uh, may we conquer the devil and uh, uh, in the spiritual warfare, prove victorious as Christ was. And let me just end by giving a few questions for reflection and discussion. You'll see them listed there in the outline. Uh, the first I say, how did Jesus meet the temptations that came to him? Think of the passage uh, that you're looking at. What did he do? Consider that. What did he make use of? And then, how do you do with the same kind of temptations? What, what, new, what can you employ in a new way to do the spiritual battle in your own life, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith? Secondly, can you identify in your own experience times when the Spirit has led you into the wilderness to be tested? You might say, ah, oh, that, that resonates. I know what that's like. I think here in this season or in the season I'm right now in, I'm kind of led out into the wilderness to be tested, I think. How did things work out? How are they working out? How did the Lord act through this testing to make you stronger in him? How can he act? How can you have hope and confidence in God that through the testing now going on, you can conquer in him as well? Finally, of the three temptations that Jesus faced, which one is the type of temptation that most strikes you? Which is the one most characteristic of you? Which of those three pulls the heart, you know, the strongest in your own heart? And consider how you can arm yourself in the future. Call upon the Lord in prayer for deliverance and allow him to strengthen you so that you can be faithful in that temptation as Christ was in his. Amen. God bless.